before. I, I wish I would have gotten that. I just hit a broadcast, so we're live now. But um, okay. I wish everybody could have heard that right there. Cause I think that is the thing with uh, with personal trainers that really know what they're doing and really know what they're talking about. So, uh, that that uh, they really know what they're talking about and putting a good message out there, like you. Uh, by the time you're done with your day of training people, you put everything that you possibly like every ounce of energy into your clients. And it's Not like, only that, but even outside of the clients, like I'm researching their problems. I'm trying to learn things. I mean, between educating myself and programming them, you know, the last thing I have time for is, is coming up with three Instagram posts for the day. I don't know how these guys do it. It's got to be a full-time job. You know, Eric Cressy is just a machine. I mean, he's kind of an anomaly and being able to do all of it really well, but it's, I find it, I find it really difficult to pull that off. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, some of his thing, like I've actually, I actually hired biz, uh, Pete as a business coach. Uh, he, he's uh, Eric Cressy. He's Cressy's uh, like right hand guy in terms of like Pete runs the business, Eric runs all the other stuff. I see. Uh, and I think uh, Eric does a really good job with diplomacy and Pete does a really good job with business side of things. So he can just like completely outsource that and only focus on a few, uh, on a few things. But uh, people like you that are like training, like Eric might train 40 people a week, but I, I mean, like, I know I'm training in over 40 people a week and then I'm trying to do the social media and then I'm trying to write and then I'm trying to come up, you know, like it's, it's pretty wild. Right. Right. It's a 24 seven job. Yeah. And, and uh, these people that uh, just sit around and, and like, I, I put out a, like a, like a poll on Instagram the other day. Uh, how many Instagram experts are there that have never read a, a string, uh, or any any book on exercise or nutrition or anything like almost everybody was like yes 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 there's tons of them yeah totally i even know you know behind the scenes people that have massive instagram followings they have these major businesses and they're kind of contacting people behind the scenes and like literally admitting things like i don't even know what i'm doing i, I want to learn the science of it because now i have all these people following me and i and i have no idea what the fuck i'm doing so you know i've seen it from that end too and it's just it takes so much time to build that kind of following that it, it, it just makes sense that you wouldn't have time for the other stuff right yeah and that, i think you nailed it on the head too like you're not just spending that time with your clients and putting every ounce of energy that you have in your clients you're also researching all of their problems you're also trying to further your knowledge and just for your knowledge and then you have your own training to do uh, so it, uh, there's definitely a lot going on there, but, uh, but just uh, like, I totally hijacked how this usually goes. So usually I give you an intro and then, and then, but, uh, guys, this is Andrew, Andrew Serrano and uh super strong dude. Uh, can you kind of introduce yourself a little bit, uh, to the, to the Grit Gym tribe? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, basically my fitness journey started in high school. I was 95 pounds in high school. I wrestled 103s and didn't even have to cut weight, you know, sort of thing. So I was always a real small guy. So that's how I got into weightlifting was I wanted to get big. So I joined up at a Gold's Gym when I was about 15 years old here in Redondo Beach. And um, I was really lucky because I didn't know it at the time, but a lot of the guys that took me under their wing initially, I had basically like a bodybuilding coach and a powerlifting coach and they were really connected. And I was lifting alongside people like uh, Chad Aches and Chris Bell when I was 15. And, you know, I didn't, they weren't who they are now yet. And I had no idea what the hell was going on. Uh, I was just this kid kind of along for the ride, but I was, you know, looking back and now that I've learned what I know, you know, I had a lot of really good experiences very early on. Um, so I, I went to school, I entered as a film major. I was always a really artsy kid and uh, realized I didn't want to do film. Um, so my counselor suggested exercise science, which I didn't even know was a thing. So my whole path through the fitness industry has always been kind of these chance happenings. Like I never really set out to do any of this. Um, so I went through school, made some connections, started personal training. After I moved around from facility to facility, I worked in you know, a PT clinic thinking I'd go to PT school. I worked at an athletic training place, big box gyms. And then uh, 2013, uh, Brett Contreras was one of the guys I followed a lot early on. He put out a blog post saying he was looking for an assistant. I was like, oh, this is perfect for me. You know, like I look up to this guy and I want to get involved. So I sent him a YouTube video, which was the application. And like nine days later, I was in a U-Haul on my way to Arizona, uh, moved in with a kid named Joey Persia, who's also in the fitness industry still now. Uh, you know, never met the guy. We lived together and we helped Brett do research. We helped him write his two by four book. I um, mean, you know, that opened a bunch of doors as far as meeting people. Um, and then I moved back to L.A. in 2015, and I've just been kind of 
building my personal training business ever since. And uh, most recently, I'm hooked up with uh, Brian Carroll and his Power Rack Strength team, uh, doing some articles and keeping training logs and kind of pre promoting their books and stuff. So that's where I'm at now. Dude, that's pretty cool. I, when you said that, I wanted to, like, I had tons of questions that came out of my mind. But, like, what's that like working with? I, I, that dude is, I mean, I, one of the most successful dudes in, in, in the sport. Ever. You're talking about Brett? Yeah. No, Brian. Oh, Brian. Yeah, no, he was awesome. Um, I mean, I took it as a big compliment. He wanted to to do anything with me. So I, um, I'm i friends with Craig Liebenson, if you're familiar with him. He's a chiropractor out of L.A. and is pretty well known in the industry. So I went to a seminar he was putting on with Brian. I always knew who he was, but didn't really know too much about him. And, you know, I showed up to the seminar and a lot of the points he was covering is what they cover in gift of injury as far as, you know, spinal health and uh, you know, programming for longevity and, um, you know, kind of seeing the long term picture and everything he said just kind of spoke to me. So I bought his books and I kind of got into it. Um, then I went to a second seminar with him at Exos in Arizona a few months later and kind of hit it off there. And then, you know, he asked me if I wanted to join the team and, and kind of write with them. So uh, that's how that happened. No, that's pretty cool. I mean, uh, anybody, what's I don't. I don't think he hit 900 on a deadlift, or maybe he did. I don't remember, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I know he has totaled. I want to say 2,900 somewhere around there, um, and I know he hit some of his biggest totals after his rehab process of essentially breaking his back uh, while squatting. You know, um, which I thought was just crazy to hear. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, like in the book, it, it, he even says like everybody told him that he'd never. Including Stuart McGill, so he, he probably shouldn't power lift. Well, he shouldn't. I mean, you, you hear that so much. You always hear. I mean, everybody knows somebody that's seen a doctor, and they say you'll never do whatever again. But it's different um, when it's coming from Stuart McGill. That's that's like a different. That's like a different level. You know, when you hear a different it from level doctor, of knowledge, but it's also a different level on the athlete's part. So I get. You know, I feel like real rehab. What I call real rehab is just starting to come to light as of recently, as far as uh, what I've seen. Um, and if you read the book, you'll see that Brian really approached his rehab with the same mindset and intensity that he would a competition. And I think that's where people tend to go wrong. They think rehab is kind of this fluff extra thing and they're just kind of waiting for the injury to go away until they can train again. But really that is just where you're at in your training and you have to attack it with the same focus and intensity if you really want to get true results. And I've seen it multiple times where you know, people are told they can't do something again. And if they really put the work in, you know, they they often are better after the fact. Yeah. I mean, and, and a lot of that comes out to you. You can correct me, uh, like, if you, if you think I'm wrong, but like, like if we can get someone to put so much focus into moving their, a joint that far mm -hmm. that they're sweating their ass off and that's the amount of intensity and that's the amount of focus that they're putting into it. That's the kind of focus that Brian had to put it or that, that physical therapy should be. 100%. Yeah, 100%. You know, you see too many of these. Uh, there was a PT clinic at one of the big box gyms I worked at. <clears throat> and I mean, I saw all kinds of stuff. There was a disaster, but you exactly anything for the shoulder was this. But not only was it just that for every shoulder problem, they'd go, they'd take the client out to a cable machine, they'd show them three reps, say, do this, and then they'd walk away and they just, and you know, this guy's all over the place. And you're like, that's not doing shit for anybody. Right. Yeah. They're, they're like going like this with their shoulder. Or something yeah. funky. One like, issue, it's probably not even the right exercise. And then two, if you're, you know, performing it all fucked up, it's not, it's not going to make you better. And I mean, how many people do you know that? I mean, half the clients I get, <clears throat> they come to me and they've been to so and so many surgeons and PTs and stuff, and they still don't have their problems fixed. So, I mean, like, there's something definitely wrong there in my eyes. Yeah, I, mean, I think physical therapy, uh, surgeons even more so. Surgeons take this look, like this, like this scope. Uh, like, if you're looking at the shoulder, they only see. Uh, uh, like portions of where the humerus uh, goes into the glenoid fossa, let's say, you know? Uh, it's, well, it's what's in their toolbox. You know, if you go to a surgeon, he knows surgery. He doesn't know movement. That's not within his forte. It's not that those people aren't in, intelligent or capable of, um, you know, I was listening to a, a podcast with Chris Kresser. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a uh, big into nutrition and he was basically talking about diet problems and, you know, if you see your general, your general doctor for 10 minutes once a year, like there's no way you're going to create real lifestyle change that's actually going to help you. So this, this is really, you know, the responsibility really is on health and fitness professionals to kind of push this message out. Not, not to mention that a doctor really doesn't have much 
education in nutrition anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like I said, their specialty is their specialty. I have several doctor clients and they're great at what they do, but they don't do health, strength and diet. That's just not their forte. So people go to doctors, uh, you know, it's, it's it's almost like they don't understand who to go to. Sometimes they get sick in any any type of sickness, whether it's a pain somewhere, or their stomach has issues or whatever. They go to this one doctor and expect them to kind of cover all their bases for them. I think that's why you see so many people, especially with chronic lifestyle type problems, they don't get resolved at a normal doctor's office most of the time. Yeah, I think that like, I mean, even if you go to something fairly, I think fairly drastic, like gastric bypass, like almost right. everybody gets away with it. Yeah. They, they and then they go back. You know? Right. Um, because that's the solution that they have to give. And not only that, but I mean, some of it's, uh, it's oh, it sounds probably like I'm bashing doctors and I don't mean to. Um, a lot of it's on the client themselves too. Just like I said, Brian's rehab process was was done with the same focus and intensity as he would an actual competition. You know, you have to take some personal responsibility. And when people are just looking for a pill or some type of soft tissue treatment, you know, they want to be fixed. They don't want to fix themselves, which takes a lot more mental energy and work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, uh, uh, I don't know, like, do you think like on some level it's our responsibility to do as much as we possibly can, but it's their responsibility to do as much as they possibly can? Or do you think it's all on one or all on the other? I don't think it's all in one or all in the other. I mean, I don't even know how to answer that exactly. What I think, I think the issue is people aren't going to the right professionals for particular problems. You know what I mean? So if you go to, if you go to a, a normal doctor that's not familiar with diet, and there are docs, so if you know, like Spencer Nadolsky, like obviously a really good doctor and he focuses mostly on lifestyle changes. But if you go to someone that doesn't know anything about diet and nutrition and you present them with you know, obesity or whatever the problem is, they're going to go to metformin or gastric bypass. Those are the solutions that they know. So if you go to someone and that's what their toolbox is, that's all they have to give you. So it's almost like we all need to do a better job of even informing people of what particular professionals even do. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And like, uh, like even the difference between physical therapy and strength conditioning, like what you and I do versus physical therapy, right. they're drastically different, but at the same time, there's some crossover, you know, like well, I think there's more crossover than there's differences. Um, and that's one thing I really appreciate about uh, what the message Craig Levinson puts out is <clears throat> rehab and performance is on the same continuum, really. You know, that's just one is on the injured side and one is on the non-injured side. But the principles in terms of progressive overload, um, you know, the way tissues respond to stress, um, strength adaptation curves, it's all the same thing for an injured person. You know, just the loads and the intensities and some of the selections are going to be different, but the principles really do remain the same. So I think there needs to be uh, more of an athlete or client-centered model where everyone is kind of working together around the athlete to see what do they need and how can we all kind of connect rather than kind of fighting each other's messages and, and leaving the person in the middle without what, what they need. How do you how do you communicate that? Because I'm going to take a wild guess that uh, somebody that comes into you with a shoulder injury and they say, I want to I, I want to get stronger, that you're not going to turn them away, but you're going to change the programming a little bit. Like, how do you communicate that to them? Like, yeah, well, people are <laughs> some of it is just feeling out the client uh, myself, but I'll basically ask them, you know, explain to them what the options are and what they want to do. Some people come in with with that. Uh, with that shoulder injury and they really don't want to work on it. They just want to lift. So there's obviously ways you can work around that, but it lowers your ceiling dramatically. So I just tell that to them. I'm like, all right, you don't want to do this stuff you need to do to really get better. We can make that happen, but you know, your potential is now here rather than being, being much higher. And I'll kind of leave that up to them. It, it just depends. It's, it's individual, individual. The hardest thing with, kind of corrective exercise that I find um, is people aren't there for rehab. They want to get strong. So when you can kind of, if you can kind of sprinkle those in somehow and they're like, oh my God, like I did this and now my shoulder feels a little better and kind of create that buy-in over time. Sometimes if I get a referral and they know what I'm about, I can just do my thing right off the bat. But if it's someone I've never met, they don't know me before, I try to kind of create buy-in over time and then, uh, you know, show them and let them see it themselves rather than me telling them telling them what to do and be like, okay, like I understand now. I, I'm, I'm down to work on this issue. That's a good approach. I think that's something that we kind of err on. Like we just like, it's our way. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but how many, like how many people do you think walking into you are, uh, they're injured, but 
they don't think that they're injured or oh i would say they're not even aware at all you know yeah i would say i would say the majority of them i'll say nine out of ten i would say people you know i always talk to this with clients is uh <clears throat> most people have some kind of ache or pain or tightness and i was the same way before i really figured out like how you're supposed to feel. And I feel like everybody's kind of got something and they just accept it as normal. You know, one of the things I, it just is like nails on a chalkboard to me is when people just feel something and they just go, Oh, I'm just getting old. And it's like, no, you just move like shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause, uh, cause it's not just age, it's poor movement. And a lot of people think that these things that are happening to them are just this product of their, of their age number going up. And really you can trace it back to something that they've done or are doing that's, that's motivating it. Yeah, especially when they're, they're like, let's say they're they're forty two years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at forty two, dude, you should be. I mean, you should be functioning at at hundred percent. And it's crazy because I work with a pretty wide range of people, and some of my best moving clients are in their mid sixties. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Uh, us too. Yeah, uh, because they have the they don't have the ego. They're there to learn. They're willing to start from the bottom and build a base. You know what I mean? Where you get some of these younger guys, um, 30, 40s, 20s even. Um, and they just don't want to listen. They just want to go balls to the wall and, and kind of dismiss all the, uh, you know, the base work that they need to do. That's what I, I yeah. I, the We have clients, we either get them on one or two ends of the spectrum. Like most of them are kind of between, but uh, like the ones that we have trouble with are the ones that like you really have to light a fire under the butt or you have to put the reins on them hard. Right. And the, the, you have to put the reins on hard where you're like, listen, like you don't want to max out every day because we won't ever progress and you just right. get hurt. And like, yep. But you still you said, I just got to go hard. I got to just work hard. And I'm like, well, I think that's your message. Maybe not like totally. And I've had to learn that lesson myself many times. And I still learn it myself, you know, like anyone that's into lifting is going to have a little bit of an ego. Right. So it's, it gets hard to lighten things up sometimes. And I find myself straight. That's why I still use coaches myself, even though I can write a good program for someone else is you're just never your own, your own best judge. Yeah. Um, so I constantly learn that. And, you know, once you pull, when you first pull the reins back and you actually get better, you're like, holy shit, there's actually something to this. You know, I don't have to feel like I'm crushing myself every day in the gym. Yeah. That was, uh, one of our, one of our guys out here that, that works out here that he, when he first started, he was just young enough to just like, he's just like that go hard. I'm just going to lift heavy all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were trying to like kind of teach him like, like, listen, if you do this, then you get, and anyway, he, he'd be, he'd look at me like I was crazy when I'd come in, like some days I'd come in and do like three sets of five on deadlift with 135, like, like just not barely any weight on the bar and I'd go home. And he'd be like, why do you do that? I'm like, cause dude, I work 12 hours a day the day before. My right. body is shot. I'm, you know, I'm in my third, you know, you know, like there's like, I need, I need that time for my tissue to recover. I just needed to get some blood flow and leave. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think people really underestimate. Um, that's one thing I'm still working on myself and really trying to push to my clients is really considering your, your 24 hour clock of stress, right? So people don't modify their workouts depending on deadlines and things outside of the gym. You know what I mean? You really got to factor in that 24 hour cycle every day, what's actually going on um, and how is that going to influence and affect your training? You know? Um, so I think people really underestimate the outside stress and its impact on physical performance. And they also underestimate the importance of just the outside of the gym factors in general. Everyone's concerned about the workout and the program and best exercise, but people aren't, you know, having the same interest of going to bed on time and getting all their calories in and maybe, you know, not getting road rage so that you're not over stressing your body for no reason. You know, little things like that that really have a cumulative effect on the performance in the gym. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We just did a show about that not that long ago. I think it was last Thursday. Where we were talking about the cumulative effect actually adds up to much more than the one hour a day that you put into the gym. Right. Yep. And I think that's what's important to kind of log your sessions. I've, I haven't traditionally been good about it, but I've been really trying to record all my workouts and then make notes of how I felt that day. And, you know, when I have a shitty workout, I can look back and be like, oh, I didn't drink as much water as I normally do. Or I only slept this much. Or I was at a seminar all weekend. Um, Is that one that kills you? Just like if you're sitting for like extremely long periods of time and you're not up and moving around uh, like you normally are? 
It just, oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, my first experience was that was when I actually worked for Brett out in Arizona. Um, I had always been a trainer and, you know, it was fitness industry, but we were sitting in front of a computer writing blogs all day and my body just started feeling like shit. But yeah, I was actually just at a seminar all weekend in San Diego um, and I had like the worst workout on Monday. And, you know, I just I was eating out, um, not getting my regular meals and not getting water and all that stuff really does have a, a big effect on how you perform in the gym. Yeah, I think so too. And like, and then you you apply that to just like the normal everyday person that sits behind a desk all day long and has kids and yep. other responsibilities, and and you're like, and they want to come to the gym and smash records. And it's like ah. Yeah, you got to chill out a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not every day, but um. And you mentioned mentors and coaches a couple of times. Like like you hire your own coach. Uh, you had some really good mentors in your past. Mm -hmm. Uh, like how do you look at coaching now? Like. Like some people think that they do better without a coach. Like I, I would contest that super hard. But how do you think of coaching today? Um, I, mean, I, go, I go back and forth from that because you'll hear a lot of the strongest guys, at least in powerlifting, say that the best lifters end up learning how to coach themselves. Um, and I think the best combination is some kind of relationship with someone you trust where you can both kind of modify the program. You know, you're willing to listen to this guy. So for example, I'm working with the guy Paul and right now, I'm getting ready for a meet. Um, and he is programming way more volume and way more stuff pretty close to failure than I would have ever done for myself, but it's been working for me. You know what I mean? So I think it's sometimes, sometimes it's kind of a compromise between the two. Um, but I think the, the, a, th a second or third eye is always going to be valuable. I don't know that I would do do better just by myself without without at least someone to consult with. Yeah, and that you yeah you're not even talking to someone just being there with you throughout your workouts. You're doing your workouts by yourself, but like having someone program for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And then if you're talking about in person and, and training partners and stuff, I mean, I'm such a big proponent of creating a good training environment. Like, I think that's huge. Like, right now is the most alone I've had to train. I get my training partners very sporadically and I don't have a regular group. Every other meet I've ever done, I had a regular group. And I mean, it definitely it has an effect, especially on your mental state. Like, you're just, it's harder for you to get into that zone uh, when you're by yourself. Yeah, I agree. And uh, there's, there's like other little things too that happen along the way. Like, uh, uh, like bench press for one, like just like having a lift off. Oh, totally. Yeah, I totally screwed my bench on Monday because I couldn't, like I screwed the lift off up and, uh, you know, it just basically ruined the whole rest of my session. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's not the same as it would be in a meet. It's not as safe. Uh, that little rollover, you know, like, it changes things. So yeah, totally. Kind of totally. Especially yeah. when you're working at maximal weights. That's one of the things that I find interesting about powerlifting it's it's kind of this final exam so to speak and can you keep all the pieces together it's such a high stress that any little deviation you have from perfect is going to is going to be exploited and do you when you go to meets do you have any trouble making weight or like is that kind of like a non Not traditional like I said I've always been a small guy and I've never really uh, concentrated on cutting weight and in fact my last meet was the most I ever cut I went from 196 to 181 uh, this meet I'll be cutting from around 212 to 198 but outside of those two meets I always just competed where I was at um, and that's a recommendation you'll hear pretty generally across powerlifting is you know if you're if you're new to lifting and you're just getting into it and you're not setting world records or winning the US Open, like don't cut weight. It just doesn't matter. You don't need to put your body through that extra stress to, you know, for us for a small local meet. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. That's uh that's one of those things that uh I come from a wrestling world. Uh and it's just like so many of those guys like that's what they thought it was based on. It was just like, oh yeah. I just gotta cut weight and then I'll win. It's like, well no, that's no. <laughs> Uh, that, is, that is not what happens. Uh, yeah, yeah, and everybody responds to weight cuts very differently. You know, some guys, it really affects their strength. Some guys can bounce back. I I don't know how these guys cut, you know, 20 plus pounds, like, you know, 15 is kind of my major limit. I try to keep it to about 10. If I feel like if I did more than that, my performance would drop pretty significantly. Well, what do you give yourself a window for? Like, like you give yourself, like, like how long do you get to, to cut that 10 pounds? Well, I, try to keep it to 10. I just do a water cut. So all that all that weight comes out the week of and most of it comes out uh, 24 hours before you weigh in and then you just spend 24 hours hydrating into the meat. Yeah, because if you if, if you try to cut too far out and really like lose body fat through your training cycle, your strength just isn't going to be there for the training sessions. So I try to stay heavy. I keep everything normal. And then that week of I just 
water cut. And that's why I don't want to get too, too far out of the range of about 10 or 12 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of those things that just is always mind blowing to me. Just uh, that you can put on, you put on 15 pounds of fat, like you put on zero muscle, you put on 15 pounds of fat and your numbers go up. Yeah, like, definitely. Yep. It's such an odd, like, it's just an odd idea. It's like, what the hell? The body's so weird. You there? Oh shit. I might've froze up. Or maybe I froze up. Ah, uh, no. Uh, those of you guys watching, can you put a comment in the comment section and let me know if you can, uh, shit, let's close out of some stuff. I'm going to hop off of Instagram and live share. Uh Oh, are you there? You there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I lost you there for a second. All right, good. Well, not good that you lost me. But yeah, um, no, I, I might have froze. You might have froze. I don't know. But what were you saying right there? Where were we? I think we were talking about cutting weight. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I think we were just talking about not uh, uh, not getting too high. If you put on a little bit of weight, it always helps your numbers. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think anyone that's lifted regularly has experienced that, especially in upper body strength. I mean, sometimes just putting some weight on gets the job. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, I was having trouble. I I don't remember what the number actually was, but I was really having trouble on on basically all my lifts. I was just like plateaued out. I was like, all right, well, uh, I'm just going to try to put down a massive amount of food for the, the, the next two weeks. Anyway, I went up like a considerable amount of weight. I went up like five, 10 pounds. And all of a sudden I just like, I blew it. I'm, I'm went like 40 pounds up in the depth. It was just totally. really, just, totally. it, was, it was odd, but it's kind of crazy. Um, but no, uh, that, that, those are all the questions. Do you have any like uh, big things that you want to get a, like that you want, like your big message that you want to see more of in the, from the fitness industry that you want to see more people partake in? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, I don't know. I guess my biggest gripe with the fitness industry would be just like this whole social media craze, right? Like it's something that's great and we all need, but it seems like so many people are just putting way too much focus into it and not actually perfecting their craft. You know what I mean? Um, so if you're, you know, I, I'll, I'll see trainers at gyms explaining just really complex subjects to their clients and then their clients in the middle of performing a really shitty looking lunge. It's like, just stick to the basics and get good at those. I was having this conversation with uh, one of my coworkers today. It's like everybody's so concerned with this, with these details that count for maybe five, 10 percent of your, of your results. So I was listening to a podcast and they're talking about. It's different phytoestrogens that result in meat from cooking on the stove to the oven to the microwave. And I'm like, dude, just people aren't eating enough protein yet. So like, let's just like get that under, you know, under control. And I'm talking about people working with their clients is like all that stuff's interesting and cool. And I love listening to it, but how are, are your clients actually doing in the gym and what results are you actually getting them with the basics? You know, if you, if you don't have the basics, don't move on to this other advanced stuff yet. And you see that in programming all the time is, Uh, And I think it's driven by the social media, you know, people want to be different, they want to be unique and be set apart. So they skip the basic message and they go to all this fancy stuff that really is a a small piece of the puzzle at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I always have our new guys, I always have them write a program and their first program will always be like two, uh, like bottoms up, two kettlebell bench press and matched with like one arm eccentric chin up and it's like dude it's like how's your regular push-up and bench press first right like uh yeah people get way too fancy with things and i think it's it's just kind of misguided because a lot of it's done in an attempt to stand out rather than to actually just achieve exceptional results yeah and achieving exceptional results might be a little bit more difficult but it's, it's more fulfilling and it's the thing you actually were going for in the first place. Absolutely. And and I think exceptional results are mostly achieved by executing the basics very well. You know, I think, you know, this very small percentage of stuff done well is going to account for most of your results. And once you have all those things in place, then we can worry about whether chicken is better in the microwave or, or the uh, stove. 
I love that one. That's that's probably one of the more funny ones that I've heard in a while. Like uh, cooking it in the microwave versus cooking it on the stove versus. Yeah. The stove. I mean, it's that's just, like you said. That's just interesting to me. But I heard that, and I was just like, "That's such a like far out recommendation for me to make to any of my clients and expecting practical results from." Yeah, yeah. I listened to a podcast the other day that was basically all about sleep, and it, it was really cool and all. But at the same time, it was like, "Go to bed at 10. Yeah, just get some, just get sleep first, right? <laughs> Yeah, go to bed at 10 and, and wake up at 6. There, problem solved. Done. Yeah. I would also say, um, are you familiar with Dr. Andy Galpin? No, I don't think so. Okay. So he's got a book called Unplugged, and he basically talks about this kind of trend of going to relying on technology in terms of Fitbits and uh, heart rate variability and that sort of thing. And it's not he's not trying to bash that so much. Um, as he's just trying to get people to understand that's not the end all be all. And I think people are starting to kind of try to rely on these things before they've actually ever assessed how they actually feel on their own. You know, I think it's, um, I think it's valuable to maybe work for a period of time and achieve some results without that before you start necessarily looking at your watch and asking it whether you should work out that day or not. You know what I mean, it's, it's like we're creating this more of a disconnect from our bodies than actually getting to know ourselves. Um, by using all this technology. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, uh, we we were looking at like, like, do we put heart rate monitors on everybody through every single workout? Do we do, you know, uh, do we do heart rate variability on every person? We did heart rate variability on every person in the gym for a year. And by the end of it, we had so much data that it was just, that was all over the place. I mean, it took a year to get to a point where we had any idea of where someone should be or like of how to even yeah. read it, you know? Right, right. So it was just too much. It was just like, like I'm not going to take a whole year before we figure out whether someone should work out that area. Yeah, and I think it goes back to like the classic fitness dilemma, fitness and nutrition really, of people having the mentality of, of all their problems being attributed to one thing. They're all looking for this one uh, silver bullet, whether it be eating a certain food, not eating a certain food, you know, wearing this uh, heart rate zone monitor and, and guiding all their cardio by that. They think that one of these things is somehow going to make them achieve much more results when it's really not, you know, they, they got to focus on the cumulative effect of everything. And then which things can we focus on that are going to get the biggest return, you know? So letting your watch guide whether you work out or not is probably not going to have nearly the effect of just getting another hour or two of sleep. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, like people are surprised when they meet me. I just wear like a, like an old, like Nike watch. Like Nike doesn't even yeah. make watches. I just yeah. like, I like how the band fits. Yeah. They're like, I thought you'd have like some kind of like crazy, like, no, nah, I don't like any of that stuff. I don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> and if you, if you see that a lot with equipment, I mean, if you look at, um, you know, if you look through powerlifting on Instagram, for example, it's always the newest guys that have the lowest totals that wear the most expensive shit. <laughs> you know what I mean, like all the guys that have really been around, they, they just don't invest that much attention into those things because they know that it doesn't matter. Yeah. You don't need a Tendo unit for a really long time. Exactly. You don't, you, you don't need to measure it. It doesn't matter. Um, right. no, I completely agree. I, and I do think some of that stuff is valuable. Like, uh, like the tech year that people are starting to, to come out with, like that you're going to wear a shirt that's going to tight, but we're so far off from having any reliable, like, uh, like you can't generalize that across every single person. Everybody's so unique. Right. And no, one hundred percent. Like, and I'm not. I, I I like all that stuff, and I think it is valuable. I think where people go wrong is they just put too much attention into those things and not the basics. It's like let's get your your program right, your sleep right, your nutrition right, and then yeah, go for all that stuff. But you don't have these basic blocks. That stuff's not going to matter. You know, if that stuff only accounts for two, three percent of your result, and you're only, you know, you know, your total pool to draw from is only this. You know, if we get this to here with the basics, now that two, three percent is going to account for a lot more. I, I mean, I'm actually a supplement head. I started in the supplement industry when I was 15. I worked at a supplement store. So I love taking all kinds of random shit and just trying everything and seeing what works and what doesn't. But at the end of the day, I know that my results really are coming from the basics. And that stuff's all just kind of fun experimentation for me. No, I totally agree. I I, I find supplements and all that kind of stuff is really fascinating. But I think mm -hmm. you're... you're right on the head like it's it's never going to be the solution no yeah so I mean, you can take you know I, I like taking GABA before bed I think it does something for me but you got to be going to bed on time to begin with for for you to really get a benefit out of it yeah, totally 
We're coming up on time. Is it, where can uh, where, where can everybody follow you? Uh, my main presence is on Instagram, serrano.fitness. Um, and then I also maintain a training log and some writing on uh, powerrackstrength.com. So those would be the two places to find me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for doing this. Thanks for taking the time. I know that uh, you're a busy guy, so I really appreciate it. But, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. We'll hop off. Uh, Grid Gym Tribe, please uh, uh, like, comment, share. Please slap the share button and send this out to everybody you know. This is, uh, it is great content. So um, you definitely there's a, there's a ton of takeaways from this. But thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate it. We'll see you later. Awesome. We'll see you. Bye. Yeah.